Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Isabella's Painting, a Notorious Art Heist, Carina Cardinal Mysteries Book One by Ellen Butler, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Chapter One. The Nantucket-style mini-mansion loomed in front of me like a bad dream, its glittering twinkle lights and festive greenery seeming to mock my utter lack of holiday cheer. I rose from the BMW and straightened the wrinkles out of my black silk cocktail dress, better known as Old Faithful, my go-to outfit for work parties, rubber chicken dinners fundraisers, and trips to the theater. Purchased over a year ago, its lines cascaded beautifully over my curves while hiding flaws and gave me the confidence I needed to get through tonight's party. You look stunning, Patrick, looking tall and handsome in a gray suit and red Christmas tie, closed the passenger door and kissed my cheek. He took my hand as we ascended the flight of steps and I eyed the two life-size nutcrackers standing sentry on either side of the front door. Your hands are cold. Are you nervous? Maybe a little. Don't be. You'll fit right in. We were in the midst of the Fort Hunt neighborhood of wealthy Virginia suburb outside Washington, D.C., filled with rolling hills, private schools, and million-dollar waterfront homes. The house belonged to Patrick's parents. Needless to say, my current boyfriend had never really known the life of living paycheck to paycheck. Don't get me wrong, I certainly didn't grow up in the life of poverty either, but my parents, a school teacher and federal government employee, had three children to raise in pricey northern Virginia. I had my fair share of law school loans, and though I made a decent wage working in the Government Regulatory Affairs Division for a medical association, I'd never known the luxury of not having to worry about what things cost. However, it was neither Patrick's opulent childhood home nor his parents' money that had me wearing Old Faithful. It was the fact that this was the third time I'd met his mother and father, and the fact that I'd been hearing about the Dunn's annual Christmas bash for weeks setting high expectations. Not only would I have to be on my game to impress his parents, but also 300 of their closest friends and business associates as well. Tonight, I was to be paraded around out publicly for the first time as Patrick's girlfriend, which meant going light on the wine, staying away from politics, and keeping an upbeat attitude when what I'd really like to do is kick off my stilettos and binge-watch my favorite new addiction, The Man in the High Castle, on my comfy couch. Not that I didn't enjoy a good party, only it was Friday, and the end of a brutally long week that I'd spent attending one breakfast, lunch, or cocktail fundraiser after another, along with trotting all over Capitol Hill trying to convince stubborn representatives or their legal aides why H.R. 246 wouldn't ruin the healthcare community and was good for both doctors and patients. The bill was stuck in committee and needed two more impossible votes to move it forward to the floor before Congress went on break. I was tired and discouraged. The timing of the big dun shindig couldn't be worse. I'd thought about begging off, but in the end I didn't want to let Patrick down. This was one of his holiday highlights. He'd been talking it up since Thanksgiving, and I'd been told the night wouldn't be complete without my presence. Patrick opened the door and I followed his lead. My heels clacked against the marble floor as we entered a two-story foyer with a dramatic circular sweeping front staircase, also encased in greenery dotted with red bows along the posts and what must have been a 12-foot Christmas tree magnificently glowing in multicolored lights, red ribbons, and gold ornaments. The front hall looked like the cover of a decorator's magazine. Mom? Patrick called as he dropped our overnight duffel bags. Mom, we're here! A brindle-colored greyhound loped up and nuzzled Patrick's hand. Hey, Ivan, how are you, old boy? Patrick said. He's a pretty one. I held out my hand. Ivan's long snout snipped once, twice, then he leaned his head into it. You never told me your parents had a dog. He's a racetrack rescue. Full name, Ivana Wynn. And did he? Not once. That's okay. I bet you're happier here anyway, aren't you? I cooed, scratching behind his ears. Ivan groaned at my ministrations. Patrick, is that you? Mrs. Dunn, or Molly, as she insisted I call her, bustled into the formal living room wearing slacks and a red sweater. Her dark blonde stacked bob, normally sleek and straight, was tousled as though she'd been running frustrated fingers through it. And Karina, how handsome you two look. She pulled Patrick down to a kiss his cheek. Karina, I adore those shoes. I almost embarrassed myself by sticking out my hand until I remembered Molly was a hugger. She opened her arms and I bent down for the squeeze, inhaling the light flowery scent of her perfume. With me in heels, Molly only came up to my chin. Mom, you're not dressed yet. I know. There was a problem with the caterer. They only showed up half an hour late. 
and I've only now finished telling them what to do. She checked her watch. It's all right. I've still got an hour, and everyone arrives fashionably late anyway, so really I have about an hour and a half. I was about to head up the back stairs when I heard you. Is there anything I can do to help? I offered. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put you to the work. Patrick, you know how we like things, and your father had a meeting run late and hasn't returned home yet. Can you oversee the caterers? Just make sure everything fits properly on the dining table. They should also be taking some of the hors d'oeuvres down to the sideboard in the lower level. Make sure they don't forget. The bartenders are in their usually pl usual places, and your father's already selected the wines. No problem. You go up and get dressed. Karina and I will take care of the caterers. Actually, I want Karina to come up with me. I'm waffling between two dresses, and I want another woman's opinion, especially one with taste as good as hers. Co-opted into helping Molly, I followed in her wake up the front stairs, down a long hallway, and into a master bedroom larger than the apartment in which I currently lived. Why don't you sit there on the love seat, and I'll bring out the two dresses. Ivan had followed Molly as well, and after a few circles, he settled into his own red and green fleece bed next to the love seat. The first dress was a shiny gold potato sack. I wasn't sure if Molly was serious as she held, up, held the hanger up to her body. I frowned and tilted my head. Hmm, okay, let's see the other one. She pulled forward a red dress that would hang off her middle-aged curves in the right places and dropped into a shallow V around her décolletage. Paired with a set of pearl earrings and necklace, it would be perfect for the event. The red, no doubt. I gave it a thumbs up and rose to leave her to it. Oh, don't don't go just yet. I wanted to have a moment for some girl time. Grimacing on the inside, but smiling on the out, I returned to my seat where Molly joined me. I just wanted to say that I know you've had a horrible week. How did you... Patrick called. He told me about the trouble you're having with your bill on the hill, and I know you'd probably rather be curled up in your robe and slippers on the couch. Is she psychic? But I wanted to say thank you for mustering the effort to come. The party means so much to Patrick's father, and since Jonathan is deployed this holiday season, we all appreciate having as much, as many loved ones as possible around this time of year. Her eyes misted as she spoke. All my petty thoughts about Patrick's parents and their opulent party shriveled and died. It must be terrible having a child thousands of miles away in danger and during the holidays. I cleared my throat. Well, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. She wiped away the dampness from her eyes. And, Molly, if you ever need, well, anything, don't hesitate to call. It must be hard with Jonathan deployed. You know, if you need to talk, or... My unformed thought faded out. Thank you, dear. You've already done so much by lifting Patrick's spirits around the holidays. I knew you were a good egg the first time we met. She patted my hand. Now, I'd better go put on my glad rags. By nine o'clock, the house overflowed with holiday revelers. Waiters roved through the crowds carrying trays of chicken satay, mini egg rolls, and bacon-wrapped scallops, while the caterers continually refilled empty trays on the dining table. The lower level was only slightly less crowded than the main level. A group of children gathered around the enormous flat screen, watching Christmas cartoons while clusters of adults made idle chit-chat and drank the Dunn's booze. Patrick slipped his arm around my waist, and I took a moment to lean against him fully regretting my decision to wear the beautiful but deadly four-inch red heels. I had expected to find a comfy chair to claim as my own and engage in conversation with whatever guest was nearby while fading into the woodwork. However, between Molly and Patrick, I had not had a chance to sit since my little tete-a-tete -tete in Molly's room. She had insisted on introducing me to any person that came within a ten-foot radius. And when Molly wasn't introducing me, Patrick was insisting I meet this person or that person who had been a major influence in his life at one time or another. My smile never faltered, I answered intelligently enough, and I enjoyed meeting many of the guests. However, Patrick and Mr. McDavis, an economics professor at George Washington University, who was wearing a blinking Christmas tree tie, had moved into discussing the derivatives market in an area well out of any sphere of my expertise. I watched the bartender pour a martini and caught my breath with when a stool opened in front of him. Shifting my weight, I waited for Mr. McDavis to finish his long-winded thought so I could discourteously excuse myself from the discussion and make a beeline for the seat. McDavis paused to drink. I opened my mouth. Before I could speak, a light hand touched my arm. Excuse me, has anyone seen Marty? Molly joined our threesome. Why, you're looking festive, McDavis lifted his glass in salute. 
Smashing party as usual, Molly. You've outdone yourself. Thank you, Professor. We're so glad you can make it. I'm on the hunt for my husband. Councilman Olson has just arrived, and I know Marty specifically wanted to speak with him. I think I saw him headed toward the library about 15 minutes ago, Patrick said. A gray-haired black man in a navy suit slid into my coveted bar stool, and I held back a sigh. Would you fetch him for me, please, Patrick? Molly asked. I'll get him. You stay here and visit the professor. I volunteered, seizing the opportunity to escape McDavis and his derivatives. You're a darling, Karina. Do you know where the library is? Yes, Patrick showed me around before the party started. Main floor, down the hall, past the kitchen. Where should I tell him to find the councilman? Molly glanced over my shoulder. It looks like he's settled in at the bar. She indicated the navy suit. I leisurely ambled up the stairs through the bustling kitchen and down the hall to be met by a closed library door. I knocked against the ornate wooden door and heard a voice, but the background noise from the party kept me from distinguishing what it said. Tentatively, I pushed it open. Hello? Marty? Patrick's father jerked, banging his head on the underside of the large mahogany desk, and out of my periphery I could have sworn something at the fireplace on my right moved, with a slight hissing noise. A white-haired gentleman wearing a smart black suit and red paisley cravat rose from the high back chair perpendicular to the desk. Marty's bushy salt and pepper brows knit, and the striking pale blue eyes he shared with his son narrowed as he said rather sharply, Karina, what are you doing here? I'm terribly sorry to interrupt, but Molly sent me to find you. I gave a sheepish smile to diffuse his annoyance, realizing he'd probably told me to wait a moment. Councilman Olson arrived and is camped out at the bar in the basement. Your wife seemed to be under the impression you needed to speak with him. Marty's stance and face relaxed as I spoke, and he shoved his hands into his pockets. I do indeed. The white-haired gentleman shifted. He was a few inches shorter than Marty's six-foot frame, and even though Marty wore a festive red vest with a white dress shirt, the cravat gave off an effeminate air compared to his host. O'Brien, let me introduce my son's girlfriend, Karina Cardinal. Karina, this is a business acquaintance of mine, Christoph O'Brien. I stepped further into the room and held out my hand. Nice to meet you, Mr. O'Brien. Bonjour, Belle. Instead of shaking my hand as I expected, the dapper gentleman bowed, his lips hovering over the skin before releasing it. The pleasure is mine. His old-fashioned manners charmed me, and I found my brittle smile softening into appreciation. O'Brien, I believe, will have to finish this tomorrow. I need to speak with the councilman before he leaves. Of course, there's no hurry. I'm in town for a few days. Tomorrow it is. The two men shared a look and a silent discussion passed, leaving me feeling left out. In the meantime, why don't you join the party? You must be thirsty. Karina, would you be so kind as to show O'Brien to the bar? Both men patently ignored the full brandy glasses sitting on the desk between them. Absolutely. Mr. O'Brien, if you'll follow me. Thank you, my dear, and call me Chris. When I turned, my gaze darted to the fireplace to find nothing out of the ordinary. A large oil painting of a hunting scene I'd seen earlier in the evening when Patrick showed me the room hung still and silent over the mantel. A wooden crate I didn't recall from earlier leaned against the bookshelves on the far side of the fireplace. I led Chris to the dining room table, which held considerably fewer platters, but still a fair amount of food, and was now sparse of partygoers. Have you eaten? Why don't you fix a plate while I get you a drink? What's your poison? Scotch on the rocks. A pair of velvet wing chairs and drum table at the far end of the dining room next to the fireplace sat vacant. I'll bring it back here. Would you like to sit while you eat? I indicated the empty chairs. Indeed, can I make the plate for you? Oh, no, no thank you. I've already eaten. I'll only be a moment. Minutes later, my aching feet finally got needed relief as I settled into the soft chair. Chris sat opposite to me and picked up the lowball glass I'd pla placed before him. Slumped him. Cheers. My wine glass clinked against his crystal. The tempranillo warmed my belly as I relaxed quietly in my chair, allowing Chris time to eat. How long have you been with Patrick? He finally spoke after finishing off the prime rib. We began dating at the end of September. He swallowed an olive. And the all-important question, where, how did you meet? We met at a winery, through events and adventures. Events, events and adventures? What is that? One of those online dating sites? No, it's a social singles meetup group. You pay to join the club, and they organize different events around the area. Hiking, biking, golf outings, tours. They even arranged for a skydiving adventure. You go on the ones that interest you, and everyone who attends is single. His brows rose. Fascinating. So you've gone skydiving? <laughs> Heavens no. I'm more of a winery tour and horse racing adventure kind of gal. I did one hike, but I'm not super outdoorsy. 
Half a mile down the trail, I twisted my ankle, and two guys helped me limp back to the parking lot. Neither one asked for my phone number. I see, and is everyone looking for their significant other? Not necessarily. Many do it for fun and to meet other single people in the area with similar interests. Obviously, others are searching for something more. And you? What were you looking for? A little of both. I enjoyed participating in organized activities and knowing as a single person I wouldn't end up being the third wheel. I'd been doing it for a few months when I met Patrick at the winery. Patrick was a member of the group? I shook my head. I arrived late for our group's tour, but since I'd already paid, they bumped me to the next one where I met Patrick. He was there with his brother. One last hurrah before Jonathan was deployed. You know about Jonathan. Of course. He dug into the potato salad. I had a feeling he'd no idea who Jonathan was, but I didn't bother to explain further. After the winery tour, they invited me to join them in the tasting room. Two gentlemen. How did you end up with Patrick? I don't know, I shrugged and sipped the wine. My mind went back to that fateful day. Jonathan and Patrick were both six feet tall with athletic builds and dark hair. Jonathan's close-cropped military cut and upright bearing bespoke his position in the Marines in serious nature, while Patrick's slight slouch suggested his more easygoing, approachable personality. Both men resembled their father with prominent brows over deep-set eyes, but whereas Patrick had his father's blue eyes, Jonathan shared his mother's soulful black brown ones. Both men intrigued me, but it was Patrick's humor and, and intense gaze that sent tingles down my spine from the start. It wasn't until later that I discovered his father was the Dunn in Dunn and Jenkins Building and Real Estate, a large commercial developer in the D.C. metro area. However, neither son had followed in their father's footsteps.